My name is Abisola. Abisola Oladapo. And I'm the founder of Momspring. Every single year in Africa, over one million newborns die within one month of being born. Using technology, Momspring is able to ensure that every woman has access to antenatal education in her own local language. That way, she's able to take the right actions for her health and that of her baby. Our impact over the long term is to reduce maternal mortality and newborn mortality across Africa and the world. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode. This is your host, Debbie Kim. Hi, Abisola. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, David. Thank you so much for having me. How are you? Yeah, great to have you here. Company name is MomSpring. What does that mean? What do you uh, intend to mean by the MomSpring? So, you know, becoming a mother can be, um, it, it is actually life changing. You know, especially the first time you become a mother um, because you don't know what to expect. And when it happens, ev- everything's happening at the same time. And you, and it's just, it's, it can be a rude shock to ev- every woman. And so mm-hmm. what mom spring aims to do is to help women spring back into spring back or to spring into this new identity of what it means to be a mother. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's where the name mom spring came from. Also, the season spring is you know, it's, it's the first season where the cherry the blossoms spring, come yeah. out. Spring, and it's yeah. a lot of beauty right, after right. such a hard, tough winter. So I, you know, after such a, an intense transition, you know, having something to look forward to to help you kind of restore and just find your new balance is what Mom Spring aims to do as a brand, yes. and that influences everything that we do as a business. Right. I did a little bit of research in order to have today's interview, your background and your business model sure. on the website. I saw that uh, you studied a lot everywhere in the world, right? You studied <laughs> in Lagos, you studied at London University of Electrical Engineering and the Columbia University. Is a, You studied a risk and revenue management. I don't know what it is. Please explain to me. And then the, you studied again the London Business School MBA. Yes. So, uh, okay, so, so yeah, I studied. I mean, I mean, let me ask you a question first. I yeah. Mean, uh, I mean, to I think you are good at the studying, right? You <laughs> you're a very academic person, and then you are <sighs> over over educated from probably African uh, standpoint, right? You never <laughs> thought about the becoming professors and the Lagos <laughs> University instead of running an adventure. Short I mean, answer, please. A short answer, please. Yeah. So, uh, from, I, I I haven't thought about being a professor. I, I don't think I could be a full time professor, even if I could teach. I got, which I've I've dabbled a little bit in adult education. Um, I I would rather teach from the perspective of practical experience. So I'd rather do courses, maybe in entrepreneurship, on the basis of experiences that I've had and that I can contribute to, uh, or in innovation. But I don't see myself being a full-time professor. I think that would be a little bit boring for me. So I misinterpreted it. I, I thought it, you <laughs> love studying. You are very academic. You know, so I the, love I love learning. Okay. I think there's a difference. <laughs> Actually, the I'm also a PhD dropout for the business administration. I start I, after I finished the MBA. I went to the. I thought I love this. I love studying. I'm very academic yes. person, but. Uh, Doing the PhD is very, very painful. So I gave it. <laughs> <laughs> Has nothing to do with the real world, right? <laughs> but when I look at your profile, I thought you're a very, very academic person. So actually, my favorite professors doing that. So when I was at Columbia, I studied uh, engineering management focused on risk and revenue management. My favorite professors were the ones who were working on wall streets who were you know running the hedge yeah. funds and teaching us capital markets because they didn't even need a textbook they were teaching us live um what was happening on the street so i think those were the professors that i learned the most from because they were teaching based on actual um, activity yeah that's my second mm-hmm. question what is the risk and revenue management i'm from the banking sector three decades yes i don't understand so- what it is <laughs> 
Yeah. So risk management, I mean, I mean, you know what risk management is in terms of financial risk, right? It's about balancing your portfolio and ensuring that you, yes, that you have a balanced portfolio of either projects as a business or as an individual in terms of your investments. And then revenue management is about optimizing true, your, and allocating your resources appropriately so that you can get the most revenue out of uh, okay. the limited resources you have. Gotcha. Like more like a subcategory of the financial management, right? Exactly. So I, okay. some of my, um, some of my classmates had financial engineering backgrounds. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I saw also you work in the, like other large international corporate, right? In the past mm-hmm. before you launched the business. Mm-hmm. So like a Chinese company, Chinese, uh, uh or the state National owned enterprise. Also company. Yeah. Yes. They've, mm-hmm. uh, they, that's a huge, massive company. Mm-hmm. They may have a, very, very different culture from what you're doing, right? Yes. So how do you yes. compare? How would you compare corporate life versus a startup entrepreneur? What do you love about what you're doing now? Oh, what do I, I so I love the opportunity <laughs> to be able to create to, the innovation opportunity, to be able to make an impact where there was none before. It's almost like you have a bank slate and mm-hmm. there's problems that need to be solved. And with a business, you are able to solve problems for people and create economic impact at the same time. I, I, it's, for me, that's, that's really what drives me. Um, and differentiating that from a, um, from a large corporate, I think every large corporate at some point was a startup, was a fledgling startup, right? So it's just a matter of the time scales and where we are. Because our vi- eventually our vision as a startup is to grow into a large corporate. So I, so what's been useful is having that experience of a large corporate has also helped me keep my mind on where we're going and the future and making sure that we're creating structures that allow us to be able to grow and scale globally. So I, I, the ex, having both experiences has been really immensely um, useful for me. Of course, there's yeah. there's there's the perks of you know in a large corporate, there's somebody to do everything. You know everything you need. There's another person who can do it because there's so many people. And um, whereas at a startup, you have to wear many hats and yes. kind of be a hustler. Yes. Um, so I think that's one big that had, and knowing that difference has been useful for us because in the beginning when we were looking for people who had the big corporate experience, we found that they were moving too slow for our pace. So we, what we found is the best people who do well at startups, especially in this growth stage are hackers and hustlers. So people who are ready to do whatever, you know, whatever needs to be done. If we need to stay up tonight to get the work done, then that's what needs to be done. Um, because we're just not a big corporate with thousands of people. Yes. <laughs> yes. By way of introduction, would you please tell us a little bit about your background and your journey to the mom spring? Okay. I'm Abby Silva. I'm a, I'm a mother of two. And um, when I was pregnant with my second, she was, um, on, at her, after her delivery, she was not able to breathe. And um, that experience actually led me down a journey where I started learning about newborn death and what causes it. And as a result of that journey, um, I founded a company called MomSpring, which is dedicated to using technology to um, provide all-around health for women, um, both physical health and mental health. Um, Yeah, and that drives everything that we do at MomSpring, is just supporting mothers and enabling mothers find um find their balance um, in what can be a chaotic world gotcha. how did you come up with the business side in, in the beginning um so actually i had the business idea when um I, as a result of having my kids so in the very beginning um after this experience of having this challenge with my child when she was not able to breathe and she was in the neonatal icu and I started researching about, you know, the challenges that mothers face, both with health challenges and just um, other um, cultural challenges with mothers. Uh, it just, it, I, I just felt a need to try and support other women and to support other mothers to find solutions to to make it a little bit easier to um, to be a mother, even in in the twenty first century. Um, so it was really personal experience becoming a mom and the challenges that I faced that inspired. Mom Spring and its solutions. Yeah, that sounds like a very personal and a great reason and purpose to start the business, right? Instead of making money, instead of, I mean, the, with the purpose of, but of making course, the money, business has to make money yeah. if it's going to be sustainable. Of course, of course. <laughs> but still, 
I mean, uh, people has, uh, I mean, that's a popular conversation. Uh, entrepreneur has a lot of reason to give up the business when they face the hardship and difficulty, right? But if you have a clear motivation, personal motivation, reason and purpose, just like you mentioned, that's a good point, I think. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. So uh, I look at the, your website. I understand your business model on the high level, like uh, e basically in e-commerce, dealing with a lot of stuff uh, related for the uh, for I mean pregnant woman and mother, breastfeeding, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But can you could you explain a little bit more? I mean about the how does your business model works, and then how does your supply chain work? Okay, so at Monstering, we have two key businesses, right? The first one is the e-commerce business, which is where we started. Uh, where we provide products that women need um, to support their newborn. It can be everything from nursery furniture to um, breast pumps and other things like that. We have partners all around the world in Europe um, and um, even in, in the Americas who supply our parts. So we, our, what we do is we, as much as possible, get products directly from the manufacturer so that we are able to uh, price competitively locally. And then we contribute 1% of all our sales to support women who cannot afford um, the cost of um, their medical um, care in Nigeria. Um, but on the, on the second side, we also recently, um, in 2020, in the middle of the pandemic, launched a service we call Agnes, where we help women who um, who are considered low income or living be below the poverty line have access to antenatal education and 24-7 midwife support if they need it. Our mission there is to ensure that every woman can access the health care that she needs um, when she needs it with a long-term goal at reducing the high newborn death rates that Africa is experiencing. Because today, um, Africa loses over a million babies every single year within the first month of being born. And our long-term mission is to try to reduce that. So with what we do with Agnes, we're doing it directly. With our e-commerce um, CSR work, we are doing that indirectly, but that's one of our long-term goals. How does your supply chain work? So in terms of supply chain, we in, we import products um, from different parts of the world. We also have local suppliers in in Africa that we partner with, and um, we work. We have um, we do our warehousing ourselves, and then we have local partners who do the last mile delivery um, to the different locations that we deliver to today. When I the, look at the, your background, I was very I'm very curious. When you told your family and friends about your business plan to launch this startup, what did you what did they say about it? I mean, did they always say it is a great idea to launch a startup to solve the problem, help with the people? Or did they say you are crazy running a venture in starting instead of so finding I a stable job in the large <laughs> company or the becoming professor? So, so, so I think the way I went about it, I think I caught them by surprise because I um so my last uh, nine to five job was at uh, the state-owned company Sinok yes. and then I went to do my MBA so it was during right. my MBA I made this decision to um to go into startup life so I, I mean even my classmates already told me I was a little crazy and my professors told me I was a little crazy but sometimes um, so it's was, good. I, being crazy is good right <laughs> solving the problem so, I, was, so I, I kind of I'm used to being called crazy now it's a compliment to me yes. um <laughs> yeah agree but, um yeah. So, but I think it also helps you develop a bit, a bit of a thick skin, which I think you need as an entrepreneur, um, because you're going to likely something will not work out, and so it's important that you don't get your val all your validation from what people think. Also, if you're going to be an innovator, you have to get used to the fact that people might not have seen what you're trying to do, so therefore don't have a benchmark to compare it with. Um, but it also um, so. But for me, I. I think because I had a mission of what I was, what I'm trying to solve. I had done, I had the benefit of um, during the MBA, doing some boot camp courses on start, um, on entrepreneurship and size in the market and really knowing what the opportunity was. So because I have this impact focus and I also still have this, um, this, I understand the, what the market size and the, and, and I know that it still hasn't been claimed yet. 
it's I, I have like two things driving me. I have both the economic drive and I have the impact drive. So it's it's really difficult to get me demotivated. So even if I get demotivated on one hand, I still have the other motivator. <laughs> yes, so yes. um I yeah, so that you. I think yeah. that has been very helpful for, for me personally. Right. And and over time, I think the friends who thought I was crazy initially uh, have come around to become like some of my biggest fans. And I think also it's good to also have people who, who would um, um, be, who be hard on your idea. So they also help you flesh out what's not, what's not quite right about it. So I think it's always good to face those challenges because it helps you also make sure that you're not like doing something that's ridiculous or, or that can't be done. So I see more of, when people say, oh, this might not work, it's, I see it as a challenge. And how can I convince you? Yeah. And what do I need to work on and fix, you know, in this idea? And yeah, and that has been very helpful for me. So yeah. I think it's just really about keeping an open mind. And yes. yeah. And yeah. You don't need to listen to the naysayer. I, <laughs> yes, I have, but you also uh, need to, yeah. but you also need to make sure that you're still being realistic at the same time. So uh, it's about that, That's a very <laughs> good point. Good balance. You need to keep the balance to, uh, I mean, become realistic. As a as you don't need to, uh, I mean, care too much about the naysayer, right? You're always banker, investor, lawyer, accountant, talk about the negative point about what you're doing, right? So you can interpret their point in a, a productive way, but you don't need to get affected by what they say. And I think that's where the MBA has been helpful because I, because I understand the mindset with which my accountant is speaking to me or my, or my finance person. It also gives me context. Yes. Um, yes, for why they're saying what they're saying or why they're concerned about whatever they're concerned about. And then as the business person, I'm able to then know what I need to do to, to make sure that um, we sort out whatever they, whatever they may be raising as a, as a potential issue. So that's where the MBA has been useful. Uh, you already explained about the, your the new business in addition to the existing e-commerce business. Mm -hmm. uh, but the can you explain, elaborate, elaborate a little bit more, what problem are you trying to solve? And uh, how do you make money? Okay. So the problem we, so the problem we identified, so first of all, I mentioned, I talked about newborn death and in the scientific term of it is neonatal mortality, which is when a baby dies within the first 30 days of being born. And m most of this is usually caused by issues that happen during the pregnancy or at delivery. But one of the root causes is the fact that women who have less antenatal education, so meaning they have less awareness of their health during pregnancy and the things that are safe and not safe to do, and less access to a medical professional, they are more likely to make decisions that could put their life or, and the life of their child at risk during pregnancy and during delivery. So what we are doing is raising their awareness of the, the, the do's and don'ts during pregnancy, increasing their access to having a, a, to a medical professional at any time of day throughout their pregnancy and the early days with baby, so that they're able to make better decisions for their health better decisions regarding where they will have their child. And in the event that they're having an emergency or a concern, they have access to, to a medical person to speak to in a language that they are familiar with and they're comfortable with. So expressing themselves is not a problem because we all know that for medical care to work, especially interventions, communication is key. If, if, the, if the patient does not understand the medical professional and the medical professional does not understand the patient, then there's likely to be a misdiagnosis. So what we're really doing is breaking down those barriers so that the women know that they can reach a medical person. They know when they need to reach a medical person. Um, and it's at a price that is free or close to free to the women um, um, so that we can then um, improve the mortality outcomes. And we are starting to, in the communities that we've been supporting, we are seeing a lot of improvement. So this is, um, yeah, it's working. The solution itself, uh, what, what you, you just described it very clear to understand. It's not a complicated thing, you, but uh, I'm more curious, interested in how you are going to monetize it. So what we do today is we work directly with primary healthcare centers. Okay. In, uh, yeah. So we're working with the clinics that are providing the antenatal care. We are additional service that they that they are providing to the women, and um, uh, so that way we are linked directly with the woman's case file in her clinic, 
and as part of our antenatal care report. So we are working directly with, with the clinics, yes. How did you find the co-founder in the beginning? Uh, it wasn't straightforward. Um, mm. It was organic. So it was right. team, it was people that I at the time had hired and they they kind of showed themselves to be um, proven themselves to be um to be very committed to the mission, to be willing to um to you know to take risks and to balance my strengths in areas where I might be weak. And it was a good fit. So I think for me it was more of a I tried it out uh, on a contract okay. basis for them to do whatever role they were doing. And then when they were proven to be able to take on more, then they came on board as co-founders. I think finding co-founders is not necessarily straightforward. I think for my, yes, next, for my yes. next venture might be easier because I have people right. that I've now worked with. Yes. So I know who I might want to partner with. But right. the first time around, it's, it's, it can be tricky. It's kind of like a marriage. It can be tricky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How many outside investors did you pitch to for your fundraising? So, I mean, the very first time we were talking to investors, we were pitching the e-commerce business because that's what we had at the time. Okay. And I think at that time, e-commerce was very exciting in Africa. So, yeah, it was exciting for them. And um, I think very little still has been done in, in the e-commerce space for this particular niche. Um, so it was, it was quite exciting. But um, we very quickly learned that e-commerce is a marathon and not a sprint. Um, so it's 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 a it's a long term um, investment even for the business. Uh, so when we went out for our you know second raise where we were raising for the um, health technology business, I think that was really exciting because it, we could see immediate monetization opportunity right. or closer and it, i think we're going to actually reach break even faster with the health technology than right. we are with with e-commerce because e-commerce has inventory costs yes it ha- yeah it's just a lot more um it's just a different business completely yeah and it's b2c yeah. which is um which in- requires a lot more marketing spend than um the b2 b2 x to c <laughs> so far um i mean less than 30 I think we've been quite lucky, to be honest. Right. Yes, I think we've been quite lucky. So it is it is a very tough and painful job. I think we've done less than 30, mostly because um, we started monetizing with our health tech very yes. quickly. Yes. And so we and so we just, we actually made a choice of, are we going to keep chasing investors that's going to take this amount of effort? Or should we just focus on closing more sales faster? Mm. And and that way the investors can come and line up and um yeah and pick a slot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so that's lucky, of, that's lucky for you. Yeah. <laughs> you you went through the very small smooth journey path. You just launched a new business model. What is the biggest challenge to take the business in taking the business to the next level? Okay, I believe that I think the biggest um, challenge would be you know hiring the right talent, um, mm. because it's our business model isn't quite quote-unquote traditional so we're we're one of the few startups that has you know one of our business models is b2g which isn't very common in africa for for tech startup um so we are a pioneer in that regard also we're a pioneer in the femtech space so um getting the right experience is tough because nobody has actually done this exact thing yes so we can't just yeah there's no cookie cutter um talent so we're, we're having to be very strategic about okay we need someone who has done something similar to this kind of experience plus the other. so we are we're creating our own job descriptions from scratch because there isn't a, a there isn't a we're not a google of or an uber for yeah so we can't yeah. just copy and paste right yeah that's <laughs> yeah so that's actually next that's, that's next for my next question <laughs> Right. I, I thought I, I can imagine you're going through the that challenge and trouble every day, right? Yeah, that I think that's one of my biggest headaches. It's like, oh right. I, yeah, it's like yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you next question then. Yes. I assume that the organization culture required the quality mindset for the employee as that of very, very different from the that of a large or the global company, right? Haven't you have a problem with a new employee who work at a large company or the work other than the startup, so they don't have a sense of urgency. You have you you face the for for example face the situation where you believe that your the your vessel ship is sinking. You need to rescue them, but they don't have any sense of urgency. For example, they are very educated. They are from the American MBA, but they talk about a lot of academic question to you. How can you deal with that kind of situation? 
and to transform so those employees. So we've we've had we've had those challenges, and in some cases, we've been able I've, we've been able to transform that and say, okay, the way it works here is you know we we need to we almost deal with everything in sprints. Yes. So we need to show some kind of traction and we have to decide what that what the measurement for the traction on whatever the project or the thing might be in a week in 10 days but we need to be continuously and continuous communication um because it's just, it's a it's a startup so we need to be nimble um so we've had to you know be very intentional about explaining so from the first week when you join mom spring you're getting your objectives and key results you're getting your kpis by day 10 you're having weekly sessions with your line manager so you get used to the constant accountability for progress and um so it's not about you know going away for three months and coming back with a with the opposite of what we asked for is continuous communication and we had to learn that over time because in the beginning when we thought oh yeah we can do reviews once a quarter we realized that people were just going off in the wrong direction and saying well when I was at that big bank, that's how we did it. And it was just completely chaotic. So we had to become very, very real time with feedback, very real time with communicating. And that has been extremely helpful. Um, and we're very, um, in terms of tasks, we use um, cloud systems where everybody can see um, who, who's working on what, what the workloads are, so that if we need to redistribute anything, we're able to do that. So we've been, we have had to become very, 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 um, uh, transparent and accountable for for things like that, so that everybody is moving the ship in the same direction. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. It feels like you're dealing with the situation very, very well. You don't get upset easily, right? <laughs> uh, so I, I think I've had I've had my days of doing that yeah. in the past. I think I'm uh, over that now. <laughs> okay, very good. The, there were the days that I used to look like you know hot head. Right. And, you but know, you yeah. you you have run the your Star Wars only five years but it looks like yeah, you mess, I, so, it looks like you master everything <laughs> yeah <laughs> so the thing is i think i we I, we we've hard i mean the first three three and a half years was we didn't know if we were gonna sink or swim so we mm-hmm. had to i feel like i had to learn and grow a lot very right. fast and i was it felt like i was failing every single day so i think from but from all those failures was a lot of lessons and notes. Yes. Okay, this is what we do. Yes. So I think that's why now it seems like okay, this is how we do. But we still have okay when we're having a new role we want to create, right. knowing that we can't just copy and paste a job yeah. description from yeah. another company. Uh, copy you and know? paste or blo- <laughs> plo- uh, yeah. plug and play. So it doesn't work for startup. Right? It doesn't work right. that way. We tried yeah. it in the past and it was an epic failure. Like. Right. It was it was almost as though the people that we got that were so qualified and with the right. masters were be, were the problems. So we just realized what we what we recruit for now is that that's that drive for results, that drive to get things done. And then we realize other skills can be learned, other skills yes. can be mentored, can be other learned. skills. But you can't behavior. You 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 almost can't change core values and behavior. Those things are hard to change. Agreed. So uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of how we go about it. Uh, you know what? I'm very convinced that you are more talented as an entrepreneur rather than the academic person. <laughs> oh, so, this, so this was a test. I didn't even know this was a test. Thank God I passed. Yeah, very good. Oh very, good. very good. <laughs> Let me ask you a final question. So, what do you have on top of your mind for the next step and uh, your long-term vision with the mom spring? I mean, your African dream, what is that? Oh, wow. Um, Too big? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, no, no. So next step, that's always hard for me because I, I live five years and in the future. But um, I think our immediate next step is to scale our solution across Africa and then um over the next five years, I want to see us, you know, across the global south. So across Africa, across Latin America, um, we were recently um, selected into the Global Entrepreneurship Program by the UK Department of Trade. So this will help us, you know, enter new markets um, like Latin America, especially where the UK has treaties. So we're really excited about what that portends for us in terms of scaling. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about bringing our solution to, uh, to women across the world, to helping families have healthy lives and, you know, grow. The, because I the reality is children are the future. So if we're able to help them have a healthy start to life, then um, it, it increases 
increases their chances of being um, even better contributors to the society. So that's my vision is to be able to do that. Thank you so much for the taking time and then sharing the, your story. I'm yes, very convinced. That, uh, I'm very convinced that you have a great purpose to grow the business to solve the, a lot of problem, uh, problem in Africa. So I'm Thank really you. looking for. I'm really looking for the hearing the, another great milestone your business grows and then yeah. uh, have a, having a chance to catch up with you again. And I'll be sure to keep you posted on how things go. Sure. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for listening to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, share with your friend, and drop me a review. Goodbye.